Do you have a, a date for that yet? I saw the houses. Candy and frosting. S- same time as, right, okay. Uh, so we need candy and frosting donated for the uh, gingerbread houses, okay? Any other announcements before we move on to our prayer requests? Okay. Okay. Miguel's uncle, Pepe, uh, had open heart surgery. When did he have? Yesterday. Okay. Also, uh, keep in your prayers. Uh, Shavanta's cousin, uh, Edvin uh, Bercia, he is still on a ventilator, and they tried to uh, remove that the other day to see if he would be able to breathe on his own, and he could not, so he is still on that, so please be praying for him. Uh, Also be praying for Shavanta. She's not feeling very well either at this time. Any other uh, prayer requests that we need to add? Yes, ma'am. Oak. Okay, Miss G. On her way to have a baby. So very exciting and and This is this is the last the last baby here, huh? Maybe, yep. Be praying that that is a successful delivery, right? <laughs> Definitely be praying for her. All right. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Dwight Weaver's having a uh, another, I guess, hip replacement with what is what it would be a revision. Okay. Uh, this Friday, and uh, it'll be about a three-hour surgery, so let's be praying for him. Anything else? How old is she? What's her last name again? Harston. Harston. Definitely be praying for her. Anything else that we need to add to our prayer list? Uh, so the last that I've heard um, was that he still is not improving. Uh, back to 100%. They were sent home. I haven't heard anything about their their son-in-law uh, up to this point, um, but definitely still be praying for them because the last I heard, uh, she said that they let him go home, but he's not. He's still not feeling very well at all. But in, some improvement from uh, last week. Any other prayer requests that we need to mention? You said your great grandmother, and you said Flora Sexton, right? Okay. How's your uh, How's your grandma doing? It's not swelling up. Did she have a second surgery? Okay, so it's her mother, but medicine, right? Okay, but she is doing a little better, less swelling. But they're hoping to move away from that, hopefully soon. Okay.
Okay. Definitely be praying for uh, the family of Flora Sexton. Also, don't forget to mention uh, Chris Williams in your prayers. Great to see him here tonight. Uh, but he is having uh, some some health issues, so let's be praying for him uh, to to be able to get back to 100. percent Any other prayer requests that we need to mention this evening? As humans, we naturally seek after what makes us happy. In fact, the main focus of our lives is usually to try and find happiness. Uh, could be in our careers. Uh, it could be in our sports teams that we pick. It could be in our families. And we want these different uh, parts of our lives to give us happiness. There's no denying that. Since the beginning of time, as humans in the world, we've always been like this. We chase after what we think will make us happy. Sadly, uh, we fail to actually turn uh, to what can actually bring true happiness. Money doesn't work. Physical belongings are short-lived. Uh, tragedies happen to our loved ones. Our sports teams don't always win. And so we're not always going to find happiness in the different things that we pick in our life. There are many different ways that we can find happiness through God's word, through living as a Christian, uh, through being what God wants us to be. There is happiness to be found. However, tonight, I do want to answer the question of how can we truly be happy? These three points that I want to mention very quickly uh, do not originate with me. However, uh, one of our teachers used to say, no one has ever come up with an original idea. You just forget where you got it from or where you stole it from. And so I don't remember where I got this from, but I do remember hearing it a long time ago and it stuck with me. Three points in answering the question, what can I do to be truly happy? Number one, learn to laugh even at yourself. Proverbs 17, says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Learn to laugh, find joy in life, have a sense of humor sometimes, and that might be making fun of yourself sometimes, or being able to laugh at yourself. Number two, live life like you will live forever, because each one of us here is going to live forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to end. Whether you are in the church or you are not a part of the church, every person is going to have an eternity. The question is, where are we going to spend that eternity? So live life like you're going to live forever. And number three, live as though you might die tomorrow. Sounds kind of morbid, but the, the matter of the fact is, we might just die tomorrow. You look at James chapter 4 and verse 14. It says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. In our pursuit of happiness, let's never fail to turn to God's Word. You'll notice those three points tonight are all taken from different areas of Scripture. And that's because if we're truly looking for happiness, we'll notice what Scripture has to teach. But I do want to tell you something about happiness. We're not always going to feel happy, but we can always be joyful. And the reason that we can always be joyful is because we have an eternity reserved for us with God the Father. And this evening... If you don't have that eternity in store in your future, I encourage you, make the decision tonight to give your life to Christ. If you've already been baptized into the blood of Christ and you haven't lived the way that you should, I encourage you, make things right with God tonight because we don't know what tomorrow may bring. But it could be that you're also here and you've never been added to the church. I encourage you. That is the most important decision that you could possibly make and you can find true joy and happiness and fulfillment in a life serving Christ. And so if there's any need, please come forward this evening as we stand and as we sing.
If you're in the high school class, you will be listening to me tonight. Is that correct? Good. Okay. That's mic uh, three. We good? Can you still hear me? All right, good deal. Last week we started uh, a study on uh, immersion in the Bible, baptism in Scripture. And can anyone tell me what we looked at? Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. You left your notebook at home. Can anyone remember what we studied last week pertaining to baptism in the Bible? Okay, so we looked at the fact that uh, with baptism, uh, the Greek word there has to do with uh, burying, uh, baptizo, where you are uh, lowering, and then you are, as we ended class last week, following the example that Christ set when he came down to this earth. What else do we look at? Okay. Okay, so there are uh, many different branches, well over 50,000 individual denominations around the world, but they can be grouped into about 8,000. And we looked at the fact that we are one of four churches that practice baptism, that is immersion. And we are uh, one of a very, very, very small group of people that believe that we baptize because uh, it is forgiving the sins that are in our lives because God told us to. Now, I started out trying last week to uh, give my reasonings for saying that baptism is essential for salvation. We defined those words, and then I was going to try and go through The Gospels, the Book of History, and the Epistles all last week, we got through the Gospels. And so tonight we're going to continue with that, but also mainly we are going to make it through this uh, material, looking at what Scripture has to teach, and then applying that to all of the questions that I got concerning baptism. There are uh, several, and we, yes, and and we we hopefully will get to them tonight, Um, but... Before we get into that, are there any specific questions that you have concerning baptism that we can answer at the end of this class? Does anyone here believe that baptism is not essential? Raise your hand. Does anyone here believe that baptism is essential for salvation? Raise your hand. All right. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at Scripture. I'm going to try my best to answer some of the questions that were given to me in the question jar. And uh, no names were on those questions. And so what we're going to do is uh, look at Scripture, see what we can find from the epistles, what we can find from the book of history, uh, and see what uh, God's Word has to say about getting your sins forgiven. Last week, whenever we were looking at the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, does anyone remember what we looked at specifically? Yes, or examples. That's that, you know that's great. That's great. Um, that, that pretty much was every verse that we had time to look at last, uh, last week. But when you look at Mark 16, 16, who's talking there? When he says, go into all the world. Or he who has believed and is baptized. Sorry, I'm getting confused there. Shall be saved, but he who does not believe uh, shall be condemned. That might be the Carl Pollard version, but close enough. Mark 16, 16, who's talking there? Jesus. So why is it important that Jesus says, be baptized in order to find salvation? Because he's God. 
And so people will try and make the argument that a lot of the teachings on baptisms come from the epistles and they shouldn't be in the Bible. Uh, red letter Bibles, well, they have a problem with Mark 16, 16. They have a problem with Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Uh, and that's what we mentioned that for too. Uh, you also mentioned uh, Jesus' baptism. Why was Jesus' baptism recorded in the Gospels for us? Setting the example on what we are supposed to do. Now, that does not mean that Jesus had sins to be forgiven because he was sinless, but he was setting the example uh, so that we can follow in his footsteps. Okay, uh, that's about as much time as we have left for review. You could also make the argument that after Jesus' baptism, since the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, that um, that was kind of the kickstart for his ministry. Uh, and I believe that's exactly what that was. Uh, but also approval from God. Yes, ma'am. You're good. So that's one of the questions that we're going to uh, answer tonight. Um, but let me go ahead and start in this, and then hopefully it'll clarify that. Um, because I don't want to go off on that that chase just yet. Do you have a question? Absolutely. Uh, there were a lot of different aspects of Jesus' ministry that you can point to and say he didn't have to do that. He, being the son of God, yes, he was sinless, but he went uh, the second mile in that he left an example. He didn't have to wash their feet, but he did. That wasn't a sin for him not to. It wasn't a sin for him not to sit at the head of the table. He was a son of God. Nothing would be wrong with that, but he didn't try and exalt himself. He didn't try and say, I am the son of God, so you wash my feet. All Every single one of them would have been willing to do that. Uh, but Jesus set the example with that. He also uh, is brought up in, I uh, believe, Philippians chapter 2. Correct me if I'm wrong, where uh, Paul is talking to the church of Philippi, and he says, look at the humility of Jesus and mirror it, imitate it. And that's exactly what we see here within going back to, to his baptism. Uh, we have an example of Christ that we are to follow. But we ended last week looking at uh, John 14, 26, the promise that Jesus gave to his apostles. This is going to be the launching point for our study through the book of history. You have uh, John 40, 26 says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So whenever we read something from the apostles, who is the authority of what is being said? The Holy Spirit. Because Jesus looked at his apostles and said, Hey, you're about to start ministering to people. I'm going to give you the, the Holy Spirit that's going to bring things to your remembrance so that you can be able to speak so that you'll be able to uh, be used as a mouthpiece for God. And so keeping that in mind as we go forward, what happens in Acts chapter 2 with Peter? What does he command in Acts 2.38? Repent and be baptized. Is that Peter's words? We're backing up to earlier part in chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came onto them and they began to speak in tongues. Who was speaking through Peter? The Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, now, as we go throughout the rest of the book of history, uh, we went through, I believe, a little bit of Acts chapter 2 last week as we were wrapping things up. Um, we didn't get to go through all of it, but let me get someone to read verses 36 through 38. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. Okay, Jimmy, if you would pick up and read through verse 41 in verse 39.
whenever we received these words, we're baptized that day about 3,000 souls. Okay, thank you. So this section of Scripture is very important because it is the beginning of the church. It is the establishment of the new covenant that Christ died for. Peter, given the keys to the kingdom, was given this knowledge by the Spirit so that he could talk to everyone there. Uh, Four Pentecost, and 3,000 of them believed what Peter had to say. They said, what do we need to do, and what is the basis for salvation that Peter gives to them? They say, men and brethren... What do we need to do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. From the beginning of church history, these conditions were presented to each person. Repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. If we want to be added to the church, what do we need to do? Repent and be baptized. We looked at last week how whenever we are baptized, we actually are following exactly what Christ went through. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, But as we're looking at repentance and baptism, it is what stands between a person and forgiveness of sins. And so whenever you are trying to figure out what can I do to remove a sin problem, Peter would say, well, here's what you need to do. Repent, that is change your mind. Change the way that you're living. Understand that someone else is calling you to live a different way, different way, and then be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Now, it's not very complicated. It is very straightforward, and there's a lot of muddying uh, of the waters. And then one of those being, how many of you ever heard that in Acts two thirty eight, when Peter says, "Repent and be baptized, for forgiveness of your sins," that that for there actually should be translated as "because of." Anyone ever heard that? Repent and be baptized because of the forgiveness of sins. Uh, There's an issue with that mainly being uh, it doesn't work with any other passage. For example, you look at Matthew 26, 28, the same word where Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. If you change that to because of, uh, it wouldn't make sense. It's it's the same Greek word used throughout all of Scripture, and it is meant to show us exactly uh, what the Greeks meant originally, which is this is the reason for it. Uh, That is, you are forgiven, uh, or rather you are baptized for, in order to uh, remove those sins. Baptism is mentioned 25 times in the book of Acts. I encourage you to flip to the book of Acts and get ready to start uh, flipping through this section of Scripture. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. I'm going to get someone to read Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. Keep in mind the book of history is the beginnings of the church. This is what Christ had in mind whenever he had the new covenant established. This is what Christ had in mind when he was hanging on the cross and he was buried and he came back from the dead. The book of Acts is the history of who we are today. And so whenever we... Uh, begin a practice in the church, I want to find it in the book of Acts. If it is not found in the book of Acts, I do not, we don't, I'm not going to say I, we shouldn't want it in the church because Acts is our blueprint. And if there's not anything found to give evidence or support to what we believe, and it's not in specifically uh, the book of Acts, which is the history of the church, not everything is addressed, but most of it is. If we find something in there uh, that we are not doing, I encourage us to take a good long look at it and see why it is that we are not practicing that uh, certain command. There's a whole issue to get into with commands, examples, necessary inference, and also looking at the audience that is being talked to. But all of that aside, Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. Let me get someone to read Acts 8, 12. Okay, first of all, what did Philip preach about? It says it right there in verse 12. He preached the things concerning what? The kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. After Philip proclaimed the good news, it says in verse 12 uh, that... Uh, both men and women were baptized. Philip is speaking to them. Acts chapter 8, skipping down to verses 35 through 37. Chris, go ahead and read 35 through 37. To give some context, uh, you have the Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading uh, from the book of Isaiah. It says, He is led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Let me pause there for a second. Who is Isaiah talking about here? Jesus. How do we know it's Jesus? 
because we have the entire story in front of us. This Ethiopian eunuch was probably influenced by a lot of the Jewish teachings at the time, that this is not really the Messiah. Uh, and in reality, Philip is speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch who is trying to figure out what Isaiah means. Isn't it a blessing that we can open up the book of Isaiah? We can open up any book that's talking about in the Old Testament, the forecoming of the Messiah, and we can know exactly who it's talking about and where it's fulfilled. That's a huge blessing for us. But for the Ethiopian eunuch, he didn't have any clue. He's reading it. He says, I don't know what on earth is going on here. And so, uh, Chris, if you would, go ahead and read verses 35 through 37. Really? Interesting. What version do you have? 36 to 38. Uh, 37. Interesting. So 37, I do have, yeah, uh, so it's found in, looks like, uh, it says 837, um, Masoretic text, um, that the M, anyone have a footnote that says M text, omit this verse? Okay, the M text there that it's talking about is the Masoretic text. Anyone, this is a whole completely different study. Masoretic texts uh, were actually the Masoretic scribes. They took very seriously the copying of Scripture, meaning uh, whatever they wrote down usually is, not usually, it is 100% accurate because of how detailed they were. So if it's not found in the Masoretic text, but it is found in Western texts, which are newer or more recent manuscripts, you always go back to the older ones. So I would side with the ESV, and I would say uh, 37 should not be there. So go ahead and read uh, 30, 35 and 36. And don't worry about 37. It's, I, and we'll get to that in a second. But go ahead and read 35 and 36. Okay, uh, and then you have verse 37 where it says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, if you were to read this without the, what you would call an inflated text, which is probably what happened in the Western text, was you had a scribe that sat down, he put out to the side, and he added his footnote, and then the next person that copied it thought that it wasn't the footnote and put it directly in as the actual text uh, of Acts chapter 8, which is, uh, I'll do some more study on it, but I do remember studying about this, and I remember hearing that 37 should be cut out. So, uh, well, but going on from there, if you were to read verses 36 directly to 38, it says, Now as he went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Let's move on. Acts chapter 10 and verse 48. Brian is not in here. Uh, Trevor, why don't you read Acts chapter 10 and verse, uh, let's see, 47 and 48. Okay, so this is with Cornelius. We're going to get to the Holy Spirit baptism in a minute, if we can, very quickly. Um, but uh, again, we have an illustration of what the command that Jesus gave to the apostles to go around the nation teaching. And you have Cornelius and his family uh, being baptized as well. Uh, just for the sake of time, Acts 16, 14, and 15. Acts 16, 32, and 33. I can send my notes to whoever wants it. Acts 18 and verse 8. Acts 19 and verse 5. Acts 22, 16. Those are some of the examples of people, whenever they hear the gospel preached by the apostles, they were then immersed for the forgiveness of their sins. Baptizo, that is buried, which is very important that that word is used because it, it describes what happens to each person. So from the beginning of Acts to the end, we see a pattern that very clearly emerges. Inseparably joined to uh, hearing and believing the gospel, you have baptism. 
we recognize the importance that is found in the book of history. Uh, any confusion on that? There's a lot to be said there, but I do want to move on very quickly from the book of history. Any questions on what has been read tonight so far? Okay, let's move on to the epistles. Baptism, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. People will say, okay, well, why uh, baptize in water? Why completely bury someone underwater? Seems kind of extreme to do something along those lines. Why is it that you would say that you need to dump someone in water and pull them back out in order for them to have their sins forgiven? We understand the power is not in the water. Just like if you were to believe that baptism was not essential, you would still have to believe in someone able to take away sins. With baptism, you are believing in the one that tells you that I will forgive your sins if you do this. Which, if you believe in God, you're still commanded to change the way that you live. And repentance is a work where you have to change the way that you talk, the way that you act, the things that you do on a daily basis. And so uh, we understand that from the epistles, especially Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Baptism reenacts the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. What does Christian mean? Someone tell me what does Christian mean? Christ-like, okay, followers of Christ. That means that whatever we do on a daily basis was instructed by God's Son, Christ. That's why Christ is in the name Christian. Kind of a side note, y'all ever hear a few years back, uh, you know there's that abbreviation, Xmas, and people were saying put Christ back in Christmas. Uh, the X there actually stands for uh, the, the first Greek letter in Christ's name, Cairo. That actually is... Uh, the symbol for Christ, that is a chi, an X, and a row, capitals, and that represents Christ. So saying Xmas would actually be closer to using Christ's Greek name, uh, and so you could say Xmas and Christ would still be in Christmas, but that's besides the point. Um, we have a very interesting situation happening in Romans chapter 6. Paul, beginning in verse 1, says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized, baptizo, immersed into Christ Jesus, were immersed into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him. That's a play on words, immersion and buried. Uh, we just don't see it in the Greek. Uh, with him through immersion into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We are baptized into Christ, and we imitate the actions of Jesus when we go into the waters of baptism. Whenever we repent, and we put ourselves to death. We do the same thing that Christ did for us, and that is go on the cross. Whenever we bury ourselves in water, we are doing what Christ did, and he buried himself in the ground, and then we are raised out of the water. We are doing what Christ did when he was raised, and newness of life, and we also are given that newness of life. So we imitate his death. We imitate his burial. We imitate his resurrection. Any questions or comments so far? I don't, I don't necessarily believe even, uh, okay, we'll say this real quick. Um, Jesus gives a very simple command to each person. He says, repent and be baptized 
At the time, the Jewish people knew what baptism was because they immersed themselves before they went to the temple. If Gentiles wanted to be cleansed, the Jews would say, get in this mikvah and we'll baptize you. Uh, and that baptism was completely going under and coming out. They were not uh, unfamiliar with it. You also have the Ethiopian eunuch who go, goes down into the river. You have Jesus who goes down into the Jordan and is pulled up out of it. There's plenty of examples. So why is there so much confusion over baptism? I have an idea. I think that Satan attacks at the source. And you see that from the very beginning. Even the earliest church fathers who studied with John, the disciple that Jesus loved, later on in their lives would say, hey, you know, you really don't have to be immersed. You can do something else to substitute it. Maybe you can get baptized with a pitcher that is made of glass. Maybe you can get in some running water. If you don't have running water, make sure it's from a pitcher that hasn't been used in a week. You know, they make all kinds of rules for it. And then from there, you have a branch off and a branch off and a branch off and a branch off. And now here we are 2,000 years later looking back and trying to figure out what is the original command. Do you think Satan had a hand in that? I think so. I mean, I believe so. Uh, but let's move on very quickly. Uh, Romans 6, 1 through 4. You'll notice my handy artwork here. It looks pretty good. It took me like 30 minutes to do this. But anyway, Romans 6, 1 through 4. Imitate Christ. Kill yourself. Bury yourself. You're resurrected in the news of life. That equals, watch the board, separation from God no longer existing because of Christ. This is the chasm that sin creates between us. That's the Greek symbol for God, Theo or Theos. And so you have man on the edge. Sin has separated them. Christ can no longer, or rather Christ brings that connection between God and man whenever we go through the same process that Christ went through on the cross. As you said, Romans 6, 1 through 4 is the simplest explanation of why we believe that you must be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. Because very clearly Paul says, imitate Christ. Do exactly what he did in order to receive the forgiveness of sins and be raised in newness of light. Uh, we also have Galatians 3, 27 uh, that says, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Christ cleanses and sanctifies us through uh, that water, you can go to Ephesians 5.26 for that as well. Any questions or comments so far? Yes, ma'am. Matthew 12, right. And, that's, and that is a whole other study that is incredible uh, to look at. We, we had to study that and write some, a paper on that in school, which was uh, the waterless places that are mentioned by Jesus. You'll remember Matthew 12, uh, Jesus is talking about the man that uh, has the demon removed, doesn't do anything to fill the void, and the demon comes back around with his friends, and he's worse off after than he was before. And Jesus, when he's describing the demons, he says that they are cast out and they go to waterless places. And then you have the demons that Jesus sends into the herd of swine. And where do the swine end up? In the water. And it says they, talking about the demons, were killed. So demons obviously cannot be around water. And there's a very, very strong tie to water and cleansing. In fact, you look at 1 Peter 3.21, baptism and Noah are tied together. What did the water of the flood do to the world? Cleansed it of all ungodly people because they were doing everything that was wicked continually, nonstop, every person. And so uh, that water symbolizes the cleansing that took place with the world. They were saved by water. God today saves through water. Whenever you look at those demons, whenever you look at the uh, symbolism in baptism, it goes back almost to the creation of mankind. And so there you can find from that that it's more than just taking a bath. It's united with a pure conscience. It's united with repentance. It's uh, tied to belief in God. And it also is tied to the uh, very powerful symbolism that water is a cleansing agent. Uh, and that is absolutely true. Uh, as we read through the epistles, you will find numerous passages that teach baptism being essential for salvation. Now, uh, 
One may ask, and we're about to get into some questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. If it is so clearly taught, why don't most religious groups practice it? What would you say in response to that? So it, on on the means by which you are born again. Now it's interesting you say that in John three verse five he says that if you want to see the kingdom you need to be born again. But do you know how he says that you're born again and how you see the kingdom? Two ways: by water and the Spirit. People will say that, well, baptism is actually symbolic for a, an immersion in the Spirit. Well, then why did he make the distinction of water and the Spirit? And so the means is often the argument. I'm not saying that people believe. Uh, clearly, whenever you look at Scripture, there is a lot that is, had, that is said about being born again, or the new birth, or the new man, or casting off the old person. No one disagrees with that. If you are a Christian, you are going to try and cut things out of your life that shouldn't be there. The question is, how we obtain that forgiveness of sins. And that's where a lot of the arguing comes from. And do you have something to say? Okay. It is. And, and, and a lot of this has to do with reading at face value. Um, that's, tonight, what I, and really with the start of this, and I'll get to you in just a second, I see. Um, Immersion in the Bible, there's a reason I said this is not what we as the church of Christ believe in baptism. I want to keep Scripture as the key source. And all you have to do is read through the book of Acts, read through First Peter. So Peter, Paul, Jesus, you read any of their works, you know what you're going to find? Repent and be buried. Repent, be immersed. Just as the flood immersed the world and buried it and cleansed it of sins, so God, with water today, through the waters of baptism, you're lowered into it, you're buried, and you come up cleansed and removing that evil that's in your life. Yes, ma'am. Let me pause there just for a second. You were reading and studying on your own, and what conclusion did you come to? Okay. Yeah. Right. It's a very, very uh, different teaching from most places, and and I, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, there are some questions in the next seven minutes that we're going to try and answer. Um, Number one, what about denominational baptism? Number two, who should do the baptizing? Number three, what is the baptism of John? Number four, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Number five, what about infant baptism? Think I can do it in six minutes? Yeah. Starting with the first one, uh, this was a question that was asked quite a bit. 
Uh, there are usually two opinions concerning baptism. Uh, baptism is, is essential or baptism is not essential, and it is used as a way to place membership at a local church. Um, I believe, Jimmy, you said it is an outward show of an inward faith. Did you say something along those lines? It's an Okay, so it's an, it, that's one of the ones that I've heard a lot was an outward show of an inward faith, meaning you're saved, and then to show that change, you get baptized. Um, right, and then you're baptized to be added to the church that's there, which is why they said you need to be a part of the church, and then we can baptize you. Um, saved through faith, and then you are baptized. That is the bottom line of what they are teaching. Um, so several interesting points to mention here. As the church, we believe in baptism for the forgiveness of sins because not the elders, Sean and Al, and, and you know, they were like, they sat around and they said, what should we do to try and get members uh, to be here at this church? What should we do to show that you are a member of the Scottsville Church of Christ? That's not what happened. That's not the discussion. The discussion was, let's open our Bibles. Let's read what it has to say. And let's see what commands are given to each and individual person. Uh, did someone have a hand up? Were you going to say something? Save it. Okay. Uh, what about denominational baptisms? I would say that those baptisms are, uh, uh, man, it was 30 minutes, 30 seconds late. Uh, denominational baptisms are usually focused around placing membership. That is what uh, usually takes place. Or you're already saved and you have the choice of whether or not you would like to be baptized, but it's not essential if you're wanting to be saved. Um, the question that I believe is trying to be addressed there uh, in what about denominational baptism, I think goes back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 very quickly. We'll probably have to end on this, uh, sadly, and then we'll have to, to pick back up next week again. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, denominational baptism, what about it? Well, let's say that you, uh, you run into a person and they have been baptized before in a denomination. Have they been saved? Let's look at the reasons behind the uh, command that was given. G Peter says in Acts 2.38, uh, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, there is a reason behind the baptism there, and so you should be looking at the reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, and this is where I'll probably get into a little bit of trouble here. That's why I'm going to say at the very end so no one can say anything back. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there's a, a massive problem at the church in Corinth, and everyone is arguing over uh, who baptized them. Uh, beginning in verse 3, it says, For you are still carnal. For where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? There's a problem uh, with the people at Corinth, and that is that they were still on milk, they were arguing, there was divisions, and look what the divisions were, verse 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am Apollos, are you not carnal? Anyone other have a different translation besides carnal? Mere humans, mere humans what'd you say? Unspiritual, okay, fleshly, all right. Uh, verse 5 says, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. What do you think he means when, they, when they're arguing over, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos? Okay, so talking about uh, really with the, the Corinthians there, they were arguing over where they originally uh, were, who they were originally saved by. So you'd have this group over there that was like, you know, I heard Paul pre preach the gospel, and then Paul baptized me. And then you have another guy who would go, oh, yeah, who's Paul? You know who Apollos is? You know, remember he came around, that real cool guy? I learned it from him, and then he baptized me. And then you had this church that's now saying, Paul baptized me, well, Apollos baptized me, and then they were trying to compare who had the cooler person that baptized them. But you know what Paul's bottom line is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, all of you 
obeyed the command that was given. You'll notice that in all of Scripture, whenever you flip through uh, Genesis through Revelation, specifically Matthew through Revelation, you will find that there is not a single thing mentioned about a command of who should do the baptizing. And that's going to open a whole can of worms. we got 40 seconds to talk about it. So, the command, if you want to receive the forgiveness of sins, how do you obey that command? Be baptized. So you fulfill the command by getting immersed. Does it matter who dunks you in the water? It matters that you obey the command because if you open up your book, you will not find anything that has to do with who should baptize you in order to receive that forgiveness. The only command you'll find, repent, immersed, come out of the water and be baptized. Good night. So people will ask a bunch of questions, okay? Well, what about if someone was baptized in another uh, or in a, by another person, maybe in a denomination? What if someone was baptized by a woman? What if someone was baptized by a non-Christian? What would you say? Okay, no problem. Why no problem? No, 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 let's keep going. My question was, if someone was baptized by a non-Christian, if someone was baptized for the forgiveness of sins in a denomination, would they still have forgiveness of sins? Yeah. Okay, but let's say that Priscilla, not to call you out, let's say that you went to a denomination and you said, I want to be baptized for forgiveness of sins. But it was a church that didn't believe in baptizing for forgiveness of sins, but they still baptized her anyway. Would she be saved? How come? She is following Scripture. If she wants to be baptized for forgiveness of sins, it's just, it's the, it's the tool to accomplish the job. So what I'm saying is this. If you can't find, you don't know well enough to go into a certain church that teaches Scripture, and you say, I want my sins forgiven, can you baptize me? And they say, we don't teach that here. And you say, I don't care, baptize me because I want my sins forgiven. Have you obeyed the command that Scripture teaches, yes or no? Yes. Now, whenever we get to this conversation, people will say, well, but they don't believe that. It doesn't matter what the person believes that baptize you, because if you can't find a Christian to baptize you, you're getting baptized by someone that is not a part of the church. And there are instances where congregations are formed in a community that has no Christians, and there has to be the original person that starts baptizing other people, even if they aren't a part of the church. At the end of the day, the command is repent, be immersed for the forgiveness of sins. If you have the mindset of, I want my sins forgiven, I need to go in the water, you find any person anywhere and you say, help me obey the command that God has given to me. That would be my response. Uh, now, that being said, we are way past time and I shouldn't have even brought this up this time. Uh, that being said, we do have a lot of examples in Scripture of people getting baptized by apostles and by people that were a part of the church. Um, the problem is there's no scripture that says here's who should baptize you and here's what their life should look like in order to baptize you. At the end of the day, you look at the command just like we come together and we sing. You know, they didn't have songbooks. They didn't have pews. They didn't have a projector. Those are all tools to accomplish what? The command. And so you look at the first century and you could say, well, how come they don't have these songbooks laid out? How come they don't have pews that are facing this direction? How come they don't have a communion table? And we could say, forget all of that. What's the command? Observe the Lord's Supper. Sing, learn from God's word, pray to him. But you know, the guy that gets up there and prays could have a mullet. The guy that gets up there and prays or preaches could have a beard, and another guy couldn't. Is that important? No. What's important? That you sang, that you prayed, that you took the Lord's Supper, and that if you wanted to be baptized, you find someone that will immerse you in water in order to obey the command. We have a hard time with that, because for the longest time we have been taught, not by God's word necessarily, I'm going to get in so much trouble after this. Not by God's word necessarily, but rather something that we have been taught by people that we hold near and dear to us. And so we say, this is not how I was taught. We cannot do this. But at the end of the day, God is going to look at our hearts and he's going to say, did you follow the commands in scripture? Were you immersed for forgiveness of sins? It wasn't, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. It was, I'm baptized 
and my sins are now forgiven. We'll open it up to questions now uh, aside from class. We have a lot that we need to discuss next week, and we will expound on this further. Thank you for your uh, comments and for your attention. Thank you.